Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Evaluating Tumor Immune Cell Interactions in Human Lung Cancer Using Multiparametric and Spatially Resolved Tissue Analysis. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is sponsored by Fluidime. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you'd like during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, simply click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Kurt Schulper, an Assistant Professor of Pathology and the Director of Translational Immuno-Oncology Laboratory at Yale School of Medicine. For a complete biography on Dr. Schulper, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Welcome, Dr. Schulper. You may now begin your presentation. Hello. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, and the title of my talk is Evaluating Tumor Immune Cell Interactions in Human Lung Cancer Using Multiparametric and Spatially Resolved Tissue Analysis. These are my disclosures. So in the next 25 minutes or so, we'll discuss um, four general topics. First, we'll briefly um, analyze um, key concepts and challenges for anti-cancer immunotherapy and, and discuss a little bit how we may help overcoming some of those challenges using um, analysis of human samples. In the second part, um, I will discuss some of the data we have uh, produced over the last years using spatially resolved tissue analysis to understand uh, the tumor uh, and immune composition, uh, particularly of non-small cell lung cancers, which is the topic of the research in my lab. In the third part, I will share with you some advances um, using uh, extended panels to interrogate both uh, tumor and immune cells simultaneously using uh, imaging mass cytometry, again, in non-small cell lung cancer. And I will close uh, with a few conclusions and future directions. So most of the current um, active immunotherapies rely on two major immune inhibitory pathways, uh, namely CTLA-4, which is indicated on the left side of the slide, and, and PD-1, PD-L1, which is on the right side. Um, while we believe that the CTLA-4 pathway acts more on the priming stage of the immune response, usually happening, uh, happening in lymphoid tissue or organs, uh, we really know little about it, uh, and there are still many questions about the mechanism of action and what are determinants for sensitivity and resistance. Um, as opposed to that, the PD-1, PD-L1 pathway is believed to have a major role uh, directly in the tumor microenvironment, more at the effector stage of the adaptive anti-tumor immune response. Um, and, and still, there are many questions about what are the determinants, what are the mechanism of action, uh, and obviously, the major question is how to overcome the limitations of these treatments to try to uh, expand the use of anti-cancer immunotherapy. One of the major considerations relative to this presentation is that uh, regardless of the use of multiple uh, model systems to interrogate uh, anti-tumor immune responses, uh, it has been extremely challenging to completely recapitulate uh, the complexity of the immune response in vitro or even in animal models. And I won't go into deep details, but essentially every model that has been used has major limitations. So this is really a call for the opportunity of learning from real human tumors, uh, interrogating them in more advanced ways. Another important concept uh, that I think it's critical to move the field forward is to try to decipher what is the role and what is the regulation of the tumor microenvironment. And as you can see here from a real um, lung cancer picture on the left using hematoxylin eosin and a cartoon on the right, um, it is very clear that the tumor microenvironment is a very complex uh, place um, composed of multiple structures and cell types that are arranged in a very particular manners uh, and actually uh, becomes a very difficult place to study. 
Um, and it's probably critical to understand this because it changes a lot between patients across tumors before and after treatment. So it's kind of a dynamic place, but also it's because, um, or is the place where most of the tumor immune interaction happens and are likely to govern um, the success of the immune cell clearing. Another important concept is the idea that there are two sort of major type of uh, tumors across the board. Uh, ones we call non-inflamed or uh, cold tumors, which are generally uh, not very uh, prominent immune infiltration. And then there's the other extreme, which we generally call T-cell inflamed tumors or hot tumors, which we typically see uh, high immune infiltration and pdl one expression. Um, while this conceptual category uh, was very helpful to sort of initiate the development of the anti-cancer immunotherapy, and actually I was one of the proponents of this um, model, I think now we're learning that uh, these are really the extremes of a long continuous, um, and it becomes very difficult now to really uh, define what is the limit between a hot and a cold tumor, um, and where should we draw a line. This is particularly notable when we start using um, continuous and quantitative analysis where uh, it's much more complicated to define um, what is above or below certain threshold. And this is an example that we have reported in lung cancer where you can see that um, we generally assign uh, semi-quantitative scores, but we really see a big range of tumors where we have virtually no T cells recognized by visual analysis or we have very high T cells, but really what defines here, what is a hot or a biologically hot and cold tumor is still uh, a matter of questions. And also I will show you that not every T cell inflamed tumor is actually the same. So now moving into what is the role and the potential of using spatial resolve analysis. Uh, my team has been doing this type of work for a long time now, mostly using multiplex immunofluorescence. And we have focused our analysis in trying to identify uh, dominant immune evasion pathways. And this is an example of a study we published a number of years ago where we look at uh, candidate immunotherapy ligands or targets that were upregulated in immune cells. And as you can see here in this picture uh, where uh, tumor cells are highlighted with uh, green cytokeratin and the targets with red, we were able to find <clears throat> that interestingly, most of the tumors that had very high levels of markers such as pd one um, ID01 or even B7H4 generally had lower levels of the other markers. Uh, and this was interesting because at this point we didn't know if uh, markers such as PDL1 were generally co expressed with multiple other candidate immunotherapy targets or pathways. Uh, and we, what we found was actually that that was not the case. And in lung cancer, mostly tumors seem to abregulate or prominently abregulate one major immunization pathway and not multiple at a time. Um, and this is actually quite noticeable for this particular uh, combination of target. This is a confocal imaging using B7H3 and B7H4, uh, where we look at this, again, the presence of tumor cells looking at green cytokeratin. And you can see here, again, a confocal resolution that there is essentially mutual exclusivity in the pattern of expression of these two targets in cancer cells, which is generally not by chance. Um, so this at least suggests that tumor cells in general uh, evade uh, or upregulate uh, immune evasion molecules in a dominant fashion, uh, but, but they not necessarily have multiple upregulated at a time. So figuring out what is the role of this in uh, cancer immune evasion and potentially in treatment sensitivity, uh, it's a major challenge. In addition to look at the tumor cell expression of targets, we started interrogating the tumor microenvironment. And this is an example of a multiplex immunofluorescence panels where we were able to look at tumor cells, in this case, again, with green cytokeratin, um, and then multiple uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocyte subsets. And you can see here CD4 in red staining helper T cells, CD8 in yellow staining cytotoxic T cells, and then CD20, a B cell marker um, in white. So you can see here that we can not only spatially resolve the contexture of the tumor, but we can also quantitatively count the signal for each of those markers. Uh, and then uh, obviously uh, study the association of those uh, metrics uh, relative to clinical outcomes. In addition to be able to detect individual cell populations and, and 
measure them. We are also develop panels to interrogate functional aspects of these cells. <clears throat> and this is an example of a panel where we, where we were able to measure cytokeratin, again, a tumor marker, a tumor epithelial marker with yellow, in this case, T cells, uh, pan T cell marker CD3 with red. And then we are able to measure a proliferation marker, K67, and a cytolytic marker, granzyme B. So now, by colocalizing these markers, we can reliably measure the proliferation of T cells or tumor cells by looking at K67 or the cytolytic activity of T cells by looking at granzyme B over CD3 positive T cells. So using this type of analysis, we first interrogated the relationship between baseline uh, T cell activation and proliferation and outcomes after PD-1 axis blockers in patients with lung cancer. And what you can see here on the slide are the main results from the study where we were actually very surprised to find that the, apparently the tumors that are more sensitive to immunostimulatory therapies are not the ones that are poorly inflamed on the left or very highly inflamed and highly activated and proliferating tails on the right. Uh, the most sensitive are actually somewhere in between. There seemed to be a window um, of T cell activation that it's more physiological or normal um, in which patients are sensitive. So what you're seeing here um, are the patients with low T cell infiltration or cold tumors, if you want, um, and these are indicated with the blue survival curve. And you can see that they do very poorly after PD-1 axis blockers, uh, which is something we kind of know at this point. But the surprise was that the tumors with extremely high activation and proliferation, which are indicated with the red survival curve, are also not getting a lot of benefit. And again, the tumors that have prominent immunofiltration with moderate, or now we're starting to call normal, T cell activation and proliferation are the ones that get the most benefit, which is the uh, green survival curve. So this actually led us to propose that there is within the inflamed tumors, there is a subset that have this uh, dysfunctional uh, T cell activation. Um, and now a lot of people are coining the term of uh, exhausted T cells or terminal differentiated T cells, which is consistent or apparently consistent across tumors. Then um, we also got interested in trying to understand what were the dominant regulatory pathways in those uh, dysfunctional T cells. So we start looking at things that were potentially actionable. Um, and we first focus on PD-1, TIM3, and LAC3 um, that are known to be immune inhibitory receptors expressed in activated T cells. So the first thing we did uh, to map uh, out the relevance and the functional context of these markers was to uh, use a comprehensive approach using a single cell um, analysis by the CYTOF platform. So this is actually the suspension-based CYTOF. We created a 37 marker panel looking at a phenotype and functional immune cell markers. Um, and then we obtained samples from 20 uh, primary human lung cancers that were disaggregated and, and analyzed using this CYTOF panel. So the first thing we look at was at the distribution of the three immune inhibitor receptors, PD-1, LAC3, and TIM3. And as you can see here, it was not surprising <clears throat> to see that most of the PD-1 was allocated to T cells, CD4, CD8, and, and T-Rex, but there was also some PD-1 expression in NK T cells. LAC3, as expected, was highly expressed on CD8 positive T cells, as you can see here, and there was some expression in other T cell subsets. There was also high levels in natural NK T cells and some expression in granulocytes, which we're trying to understand the role. Interestingly, for TIM3, <clears throat> the landscape was very different, and the majority of the signal was actually not detected in T cells, <clears throat> but on myeloid cells and dendritic cells, as you can see here. So this was actually a surprise uh, when we initially uh, look at this data. What was most interesting about this is that when we look at the extremes of the T cell population relative to these markers, so the ones that co-expressed or upregulated together PD-1, LAC3, and TIM3, compared to the ones that didn't express PD-1, LAC3, and TIM3, we found a very prominent functional difference. <clears throat> and as you can see here in the heat map, but also at the individual marker level, we found that those T cells expressing the three immune inhibitor receptors had uh, consistently higher levels of activation markers such as CD69 or 41BV or CD137, but also high markers of proliferation, um, K67, and cytolytic activity, which is granzyme B. 
this was very consistent with what we already found relative to these hyperactivated or dysfunctional T cells in the tumor microenvironment. What was interesting and quite novel was that we were able to also see that those cells had signs of uh, dysfunction, and in this case, noted as upregulation of uh, very clear pro-apoptotic proteins, FAS and BIM. So this at least suggests that the cost maybe of uh, extreme activation and proliferation is the upregulation of cell death programs, and this could, could explain why these cells are actually dysfunctional and they're insensitive to uh, current PD-1 inhibitors. We then look at the tissue <clears throat> validating a panel for these markers, and as you can see here, we found very consistently that LAC3 and PD-1 were predominantly expressing CD3 positive T cells. We're also able to now confirm in tissue that the TIM3 signal was predominantly allocated to non-CD3 positive cells in the tumor bed consistent with macrophages, and you can see here many of them um, expressing high levels of TIM3. However, we do see, again, some signal in, in uh, CD3 positive T cells. To understand what was the role or the potential link between uh, the expression of these uh, inhibitor receptors and sensitivity and resistance to PD-1 axis blockers, we actually look at baseline samples from 90 patients with lung cancer treated with PD-1 axis blockers in our institution. And what we were able to find is that um, upregulation or dominant expression of LAC3 in T cells at baseline was actually clearly associated with lower outcome after PD-1 axis blockers. And we didn't see the same effect for PD-1 or TIM3. Another interesting aspect is that the effect of uh, upregulation of LAC3 on T cells was independent from the effect of PDL1. And you can see here in panel D that the, the tumors with low LAC3 and high PDL1 did really well after PD1 blockade, but the ones that had high LAC3 and low PDL1 did the worst. Uh, again, supporting that the PD1 pathway and the LAC3 pathway are independent and potentially complementary. One important question about LAC3 that has been out there for a while um, is the, the, the nature of the candidate or potential uh, ligands that could activate this receptor. And I won't go into too much detail now, but in collaboration with the lab of Liping Chen, uh, we were able actually to discover and characterize the major uh, LAC3 ligand relevant in lung, in lung cancer, uh, which is called FGL1 or fibrinogen-like protein 1, uh, and this was work done, again, by Jun Wan in, in Liping Chen Lab. Uh, and we were able to show that this ligand was not only uh, powerful in cancer, but it was also upregulated in a fraction of human tumors. Uh, so this is really opening the doors to understand the LAC3 FGL1 pathway in depth and potentially support development of treatments. So now we wanted to move on and try to integrate um, the tumor metrics, the T cell metrics, and maybe other functional aspects into a single panel. And this was really hard to do in a comprehensive manner using multiplex immunofluorescence, which we can accommodate um, maybe up to seven or eight markers reliably. So to address this question, we moved on to a, a different uh, physics and technology. In this case, we use imaging mass cytometry, which as opposed to immunofluorescence, uh, uses uh, um, mass spectrometry and, and rare earth metals as a signal detection. So in a, in, in a nutshell, what we do here, we conjugate primary antibodies that are known to work in paraffin tissue or validated to work in paraffin tissue, and we incubate them all together with the sample, uh, and then they're uplated with a 213 um, uh, laser, a nanometer laser, very sharply at each micron in the tissue, and that produces little ion clouds that are flown through an inert gas chamber and then resolved by mass spec to be relocated to each micron or pixel where they were obtained. So we can really obtain a one micron resolution microscopic image of the tissue, but then looking at multiple markers. And just as a note, you can see here the spectral overlap of fluorescence, which is generally a big problem to allocate many markers and, and separate the signal uh, relative to imaging mass cytometry, where the spill over between the channels is much, much less prominent and allow uh, um, a res better resolution of mul multiple markers. So what I will show you next is the preliminary results from the first panel, which we called uh, Yale IMC uh, Immune Oncology Panel 1 in which we included 29 markers 
uh, that are indicated in this table, including some structural components that we generally use for tissue segmentation. Uh, then we use cell phenotypic markers to highlight uh, different cell populations. We also added some functional markers to understand the, the functional profile of those cells. And then a number of candidate immunotherapy targets that we expected to be present um, in tumor and immune cells. So this is just a quick example of a, of a validation or orthogonal validation of tissue analysis using immunofluorescence, which again, we have validated extensively and used for years relative to imaging mass cytometry. And this is just a representative lung cancer tissue where we actually um, did the immunofluorescence using a metal conjugated antibody. And then the same tissue was brought to the IMC instrument and laser ablated. So this is actually the very same tissue and the very same cells. And just to select a few markers, we put here cytokeratin in green, CD3 in red, uh, and a DNA nuclear marker in blue. But you can see already that the pattern of staining and the location of the markers and the, even the intensity are quite comparable using the two platforms, which is again an indication of the, the efficacy and the, the capacity that we have to use uh, this technology to analyze tissues. So this is now an example of a human lung cancer stained with this uh, 29 marker panel. <clears throat> and um, we break this into multiple sub panels with different markers, but you can see here, for example, in panel one, that the tumor cells, again, are positive for green cytokeratin, and they show a high level of proliferation revealed as the white K67. Then CD3 positive T cells are in the stroma, um, and then we can start allocating other markers. So essentially what I'm trying to show here is that we have spatial context, we can select areas where to measure, uh, but we are also producing a lot of data because we can either measure this in a compartment-based or a single cell-based uh, model. So this is an example um, using um, non-commercial software or, or freeware uh, where we have been able to analyze the tissue using a single cell modality. So this is uh, segmentation using the nuclear signal. You can see here how we can create um, individual cell frames uh, and then we can actually call the phenotype from all the markers extracting the individual cell phenotypes. So this is a, a T-SNP plot including multiple cell phenotypes from multiple cases but really we can get here to the several thousands and even millions of cells and each of them has a spatial allocation and annotation. Another way of looking at this is to instead of um, looking in an unbiased manner at multiple cell phenotypes we can actually select compartments based on the expression of particular markers. So this is an example now where we broke into two panels using the markers that are indicated here and we selected tumor and stromal areas by the expression or absence of cytokeratin. So you can see here how we selected the tumor compartment using cytokeratin, in this case highlighted in red, and then we individualized the cells using histone 3 to obtain both a compartment, in this case the tumor compartment, and then uh, individual cell phenotypes using uh, other markers. So when doing this analysis, uh, the first thing we look at uh, was a cohort of patients treated with immunotherapy. Uh, so these are again baseline specimens, but we knew the outcome of those patients. So we knew they responded to immunotherapy. In this case, we call them durable clinical benefit, which are indicated in blue. And then there were patients that didn't respond to immunotherapy or had a very short stable disease less than six months, which are indicated in red, and we call no durable benefit. So when we collected individual CD8 positive T cells uh, and we stratify them by the clinical outcomes, we clearly were able to see that as expected, and as I show you with fluorescence and Cytof, uh, those uh, tumors that are uh, less sensitive to immunotherapy generally displayed uh, T cells that had higher levels of activation but also higher levels of exhaustion and dysfunction. And they were characterized by elevated levels of plaque 3 TIM3, PD-1, but also CD25, a proliferation marker, K67, Ransine B, and even high levels of uh, uh, receptor CD3 and CD8. So again, this is consistent with the idea that uh, tumors from patients that are insensitive to treatment generally have T cells with uh, um, hyperactivation or dysfunction and terminal differentiation. 
The interesting thing is that uh, because of these extended panels, we we're able now to simultaneously look at two more cells that are positive for cytokeratin. And again, here we selected cells based on both the expression of cytokeratin and also morphological features. And what was very interesting is that we we're able to see that again, there were prominent phenotypic difference in the tumor cells between patients that were sensitive to PD-1 axis blockers and insensitive. So what you can see here is that in general, tumors from patients that were insensitive, again in red, uh, they generally had tumors with high DNA markers, in this case histone 3, but also high proliferation and also less differentiation characterized by lower levels of cytokeratin and high levels of the mesenchymal marker vimentin. Notably, the tumors from insensitive patients also differentially upregulated multiple immune inhibitory pathways such as CD47, B7A3, B7A4, and VISTA. So again, this shows that uh, there is a, a clear tumor phenotype associated with this uh, T-cell dysfunction and also resistance to immune checkpoint blockers. So one important point uh, about analyzing the tissue using the spatial context is that segmenting the tissue in a reliable manner is actually a very difficult task. Uh, it's very difficult to achieve a high level or high grade segmentation, but it's also very time consuming and cumbersome. So to actually overcome some of these uh, uh, limitations, we generated a machine learning algorithm that was segmentation independent. So what we look at here was uh, in, uh, very similar to what we do when we do uh, Google Maps or when we look at the profile of a city, looking at the skyline or the peaks of the building heights. Uh, so using a similar principle, we generated a machine learning algorithm to detect the high peaks of signals across the tissue. Uh, without having to segment, but being able to locate the little neighborhoods associated with the peaks of signal intensity for all the markers or multiple markers. And to tell a long story short, what we found using multiple algorithms and trainings is that there were certain patterns that were enriched in patients that were resistant to immunotherapy, which are indicated by accumulation of these red little patches and very few of the blue patches uh, and then there were accumulation of uh, other little patches or neighborhoods in patients that were sensitive that you can see as an example here that were generally these blue patches and very few of the red patches. So again, this allow us to locate little neighborhoods including tumor and immune cells that were differentially expressed uh, in patients that were sensitive and resistant and this was uh, regardless of the tissue segmentation. So to prove or test the, the performance of this stratification method, we actually look at the segregation of responders and non-responders using this model. And as you can see on the upper left in a 3D TSNI plot, where the responders are indicated in yellow and the non-responders in blue, uh, we are able to clearly separate spatially uh, those patients or most of the patients that were sensitive and insensitive to treatment. Uh, again, these uh, samples are used at baseline. And this was clearly not by chance because we didn't see any segregation when we just put the patients in the order at which they were acquired. So clearly there was a non-random distribution uh, relative to the clinical outcomes. So then to validate this, we actually look at an, another cohort, but we also did uh, a leave one out cross-validation using an informatic approach. And using this um, model, we were actually able to find or accurate or predict accurate response or resistance in nearly 87% of patients, which is really much higher than what we can do today using other markers such as PDL1, tumor mutational burden, or, or T cells alone. And as expected, this separation was associated with outcomes, uh, which is shown on the progression free survival. So, in conclusion, I hope I convince you that uh, resistance to immunotherapy. Uh, can be both uh, mediated by uh, anti-tumor pressure and de deregulated activation of T cells. And, and really what we know now, um, mostly after this data, is that um, the resistance to immunotherapy can be tumor mediated, what, what I call tumor privilege, typically associated with defective antigen presentation. We have, we have shown in, in other publications, but also changes in tumor differentiation and, and also upregulation of alternative regulatory pathways. Um, but also resistant can be immune mediated. And this is what I call immune tolerance, where we at least can see clearly T cell immune dysfunction characterized by uh, terminal differentiation and exhaustion of those T cells, 
but also maybe engagement into um, T cell death uh, or apoptotic programs, which is what I just showed you for uh, uh, upregulation of the LAC3 FGL1 pathway. And there may be other mechanisms uh, that are involved. And now I think we are have uh, enough evidence that these two may be related, and, and this is something to also be explored in the future. Um, and interestingly, what I didn't show you is that we have seen some of these uh, phenotypes also associated with acquired resistance. So this may not be uh, able to explain primary resistance, but also maybe acquired or secondary resistance. So in conclusion, I hope I convince you that biomarkers can support and argu arguably should be used to uh, select patients for anti-cancer immunotherapy. And I think it's not very optimistic that the way we're currently using immunotherapy is pretty much like chemotherapy. Um, second, I think um, we have convincing evidence that resistance to immunostimulatory therapy can be both tumor and immune mediated. And there may be actually links between these two programs that needs to be addressed. Third, that the LAC3 FGL1 pathway may be a dominant immunization pathway in a fraction of non-small cell lung cancers, and this could be therapeutically exploited by perhaps selecting uh, patients with this dominant biology um, and submit them to treatments targeting this pathway selectively. Fourth, that uh, the analysis of tumor and immune contexture can support understanding sensitivity and resistance to immune checkpoint blockers, and that there's clearly the potential to integrate the signal to hopefully develop better biomarkers in the future for both clinical use and perhaps for drug development. And finally, that there are prominent developments um, allowing deep analysis of intact tumor specimens. I just show you the data with imaging mass cytometry, and there is a lot of potential for discovery um, using this type of approaches um, and also uh, using advanced bioinformatics to be able to retrieve the meaningful signal and then hopefully uh, contribute um, to, to treat better our patients. So with that, I would like to end and acknowledge the people who are actually doing the work that I just presented. So a um, lot of acknowledging to my lab and these are uh, my current lab members, former lab members, a lot of which contributed to the work that I just shared. Um, and then obviously internal collaborators, external collaborators and the funding sources. Um, and I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. And thank you so much, Dr. Schulber, for that informative presentation. And we will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on that Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. <clears throat> so let's get started. It looks like we have some questions already coming in from our audience. Thank you so much for your participation. Dr. Schulper, our first question is, is there any relationship between hot, cold tumors in an upregulation of a particular tumor marker? Yes, yeah, so, so can you hear me? I can. Yeah. Okay, so, so yeah, that's a great question. And I think we're just starting to discover uh, elements in the tumor that somehow govern or interact with the tumor immune contexture. Uh, at this point, we know from a few genetic events that are clearly associated with the, the likelihood of that tumor to be more or less inflamed, some of which are well-known uh, kinase mutations such as EGFR, KRAS, ALK, and ROS, and this is uh, specific for lung cancer. We generally see that those tumors driven by kinase uh, are generally less T-cell inflamed. And there are other things such as uh, new or recently discovered genes such as uh, STK11, LKB1, that have been shown to also be commonly associated with uh, poorly inflamed tumors. Uh, so that's from the genomic standpoint. I think the, the, from the phenotypic standpoint, we're just uh, learning that, uh, that there are some uh, programs also associated with high or low inflamed tumors, but I, I think this is still to be the, determined and to be implemented. Thank you so much. This next question from our audience member is a two-part question. How are antibodies for IMC validated? And do antibodies validated for IHC or IF work? Yeah, so this is a very important question because uh, most of the antibodies that are commercially available are not necessarily suitable for paraffin, uh, formally fixed paraffin-embedded tissue. So, so the question here, 
circles back to the notion that before thinking about using things like IMC, we need to make sure that the antibodies work in formally fixed and paraffin embedded tissue, uh, and that then allows them to be standardized using IMC. So the, sh the short answer is that if the antibody has been validated for IHC or immunofluorescence, they should work with no problem in IMC. If the antibodies have not been validated for formally fixed paraffin embedded tissue, they need to be validated before uh, being used. Thank you so much. And I, again, want to thank our audience for their questions coming in. We have time for a couple more questions. Dr. Schulter, how is the sensitivity of IMC relative to other methods? Yes, yeah, so, so the, there are differences in the sensitivity that can be achieved uh, compared to IHC or immunofluorescence, and that depends on the detection system being used. Uh, in general, when we use immunofluorescence or IHC, we use polymers or dextrins that amplify a lot of the signal. Uh, with IMC, we, we believe that we're including about 100 uh, metals per antibody. Uh, in, in the, that varies a little bit depending on the conjugation, but that's a, a fair bit of signal amplification. So um, I think at this point, using the top amplification system in fluorescence, we may achieve a higher sensitivity than IMC, but IMC uses... Uh, a sensitivity that it's in the range of uh, 100 and maybe a little bit more than 100 uh, tax per antibody. So there is high sensitivity and amplification, uh, but probably not so much a certain uh, amplification system that can be used in fluorescence. Thank you. We have time for one more question. What is the optimal tissue area size for analysis using IMC? Yes, yeah, so this is an important question because it has to do with the, the throughput of the, of the technology. So one of the things uh, we do now, generally, we use IMC to analyze relatively small tissue areas, and that has to do with the sort of time uh, required to analyze. Uh, so we generally use this as a discovery tool. Uh, and I think at this point, uh, using tissue microarrays or, or prioritizing relatively small tissue areas is important to achieve a reasonable throughput. Uh, and I think proposing studies using analysis of a whole tissue section is still, uh, is still I think that we are a little early to, to actually get that done. Thank you, Dr. Schilper. I want to thank you again for your presentation today and for your important research. Would you like to provide the audience with any final comments before we close today? Yes, yeah, so I think, um, I, I hope um, I convince everyone that uh, uh, analyzing uh, human tumors and the immune contexture is an important task. We can learn a lot, um, and I think there, the, the future for spatially resolved tissue analysis is beautiful. Uh, it's bright, and I think there is a lot to do. Thank you. And thank you very much, sir. I'd also like to thank Fluidine for sponsoring today's event, and I want to encourage the audience members to listen to other presentations as part of this day and explore the Fluidine virtual environment and their booth. And before we go, I want to thank the audience for joining us and for their interesting questions. And questions we didn't have time for today and those submitted on the demand period will be addressed by the speaker via contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand through July of 2021. Until next time, everyone, take care, be safe, and thank you. Bye-bye.